today, I just want us, as I started the first service, just want us to pray together in this moment for those that are affected by the government shutdown. We have people that are affected by this and some getting ready to go on uh, their second paycheck without any money. There's nothing coming in right now. And we may say, well, it's retroactive, but, but the point is we need to get this thing moving. There needs to be movement. It affects people that have bills that are due now. And uh, we just want to pray as a church. You know what? We have faith to believe. It's mountain-moving prayer and faith together. So think about how much faith is in this room not right now. So I just want us to just join our faith together. Will you join me in prayer? Will you close your eyes and bow your heads? Father, we right now come and petition you that, Father, we know before any battle makes it to the natural, it's in the supernatural. And, Lord, we push this thing back on this government shutdown, that, Lord, the battles that are going on and the biases, I pray that there would be a coming together, Lord, uh, of, of opinion. We know we have our opinions and disagreements on things, but, Father God, I pray for the White House and the direction of our president and those that are in that office and uh, on both sides, Father, I pray that there would be unity so that these workers can get back, Lord, and receiving a paycheck, even though they're working and not receiving it. Father, undergird them and give them your strength and your peace. Even now, there's so much anxiety, Lord, that goes on by people that are affected by this right here in our own body or in the sound of my voice. We pray that there would be a release in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. My purpose today as we go into part two on our series, Immeasurably More, we have chosen that as our theme for 2019 immeasurably more. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3 as we look in verse 20. And I want to encourage you, uh, I know the majority of you weren't able to be here last week, but you can take a look at our, at our website and our app to listen to that message that is so critical as I spoke last week on growing our capacity inward for more of God in 2019. I want to encourage you to listen to it, download it, hear it, what God is saying to us as a church. And so these next couple of weeks, we're continuing to build on that. But we are believing for a year of immeasurably more. That if God allows us to get to the end of the year, we're going to look back and be absolutely astonished and amazed at what God has done. Amen. So I just want to encourage you, Ephesians 3, verse 20. The Apostle Paul is speaking to this church as he's speaking to us today. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is work that is at work within us. His power. Can you say his power? His desire, God's desire is to see us filled to overflowing with every good, wonderful, and perfect gift from him. Amen. His purpose is to build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for it, that it would be expanded now as he rose again and to echo his name throughout the generations. How many of you enjoyed that first new song that we sang today on Echo? That was powerful, wasn't it? That was some good stuff. We're called to echo what God has done in and through us to the, to the nations of the earth, right here even in Stephen City and Clearbrook as we expand. I want to talk to you today about God's power, God's power in our expectation. Can somebody say expectation? There's a period that we know of, 400 years of silence at the end of the book of Malachi in the Old Testament to the New Testament. We move 400 years ahead and we pick up the story in the book of Luke and we see what was happening in the gospel writers in Luke chapter 3 and verse 15. We see the atmosphere that was taking place in the Gospels. And it says, and the people were in expectation. One version said it like this, that people were on tiptoes in anticipation and expectation for God to move and show up. I want to let you know it's tiptoe time again at Abundant Life Church. Amen. It's tiptoe time again at Abundant Life Church. I love that version of that where it says that we are, ha are supposed to be called to have a godlike expectation. So it's tiptoe time around Abundant Life Church. It's tiptoe time in the body of Christ. We need to expect God to pour out his power and his spirit. Amen. Listen, 
you and I have always been, we've probably been in a crowd somewhere many times, and maybe we're near the back, and we're trying to see something or someone that is yet to come. And we're trying to look, and we see with anticipation, what do we do? Well, we go up on our tiptoes to try to look over the crowd to see what is out there. I want to see that something, or I want to see someone that is yet to come. And God wants us to be and live our life with tiptoe expectation in these days. Amen? We need to start getting up on our tiptoes and expect to God to do the impossible and the impossibly more. More than all we could ask or imagine according to His power that is at work with this, within us. So with great anticipation. I want us to come with great expectation and saying, Lord, what's going to happen in this service today? That God is not finished with you and me in this service today, but we serve a God that is immeasurably more. God, what are you about ready to do in my relationships? It's immeasurably more. What are you about ready to do in my small group? That's immeasurably more. What are you about ready to do in this community, God, that is immeasurably more? And in this nation, there is immeasurably more of what you want to accomplish. That you would pray in expectation, that you would begin to sow in expectation, because the atmosphere that the Holy Spirit is poured out in is when his people are in expectation. A godly expectation is being on your tiptoes with expectation, believing that God is about ready to do the immeasurably more in this church and in your life today. <clears throat> Expect God, will you, to pour out his spirit. God's not done with this service. You may be done, but God's not done. God is here to pour out his power on us today. That listen, in this time, I'm speaking right now. I'm expecting pain to leave your body in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That I'm expecting healing to come if you need healing right now. How many of you are just willing to do that right now? To expect pain to leave people's body in the name of the Lord Jesus in this place. To, to, uh, there would be a level of expectation that would come for God's best in your life. That, that, that a spirit of fear would go. If you have fear today, I'm going to let you know what the Bible calls that. That's a spirit. Fear is a spirit. That a, that a spirit of fear would leave your life now. That depression, that discouragement would go in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen? And that we would expect his power. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 said that we are children of God and heirs. And now because of Christ. We are joint heirs. And I want to break that down for you today because a lot of people hear the word joint and think about marijuana. But let me tell you something. There's something better than cannabis in your coffee or whatever it may be. And marijuana, you're smoking on the side. You and I are called to be joint heirs. We are co-heirs, your version may say. We are co-heirs, which means we have a double claim to everything in heaven. We have a double claim to every promise in the word of God. We are joint heirs. It's ours because Jesus says, I gave it to you, right? Amen. The power of expectation. Let me just take you through a few of these things in the New Testament of Acts chapter 3. And if I'm talking fast, it's because I'm excited today. All right, so just hang with me here. Acts chapter 3 and verse 6. When the Bible said that there was a lame man who was brought to the temple. Remember the story. And he was laying there daily. There's this phenomenal scripture that we are probably very well aware of in verse 6 of Acts 3. And we see that the miracle was dependent on Peter and James. What you see inside of there, something was going on in their life. They, they said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, I know the power is in the name of Jesus just like you. I understand that it's there, but it did not activate itself by itself, right? It took somebody actively involved in the process. Notice the miracle of the lame man was not dependent upon in Acts 3 and 5. It says, where was it? When the man looked upon them, the Bible says, expecting to receive something from them, you're looking at me, and I'm looking at you today, and I'm believing that God is going to do something great in this service by the time we get to the end. Because by the time we get to the end, we're going to sing, and we're not done worshiping the Lord today, that we're going to come back and sing. But then we're going to have you come, 
And we're going to lay hands upon you today. And we believe that this is an atmosphere where God can do something great and mighty right here, right now. Because we expect it because it's who he is. Do you see, he expected to receive something from them. This man said, I don't hope, I don't think, I don't believe. I expect to receive something from the man of God. There is something that the enemy is tormented by that makes Satan take rollades. I want you to know that today. There's one thing that will upset him more than anything else. And you got to get this. The devil is not concerned with what you used to be, not with concerned with what you are, but the devil is terrorized by what you can become. He is terrorized by what you can become and that I want to let you know today that you may have come exhausted, but the will of God is never exhausted for you. His power is never exhausted for you. You need to know that today. You may have come exhausted, but his power is never exhausted. You may have come stressed out, but God is never stressed out. Amen? So the devil's not bothered by our past. But let me tell you something, but it appears by how he's been attacking lately that there must be something that has not appeared yet in your life that is yet to come. If you'll just wait on the Lord with tiptoe anticipation, God is going to show up in your life. Amen? Come expecting what God wants to do, that he's going to use you and me to shake the nations of the earth. We're called to do that. So the measurably more is ahead of you and not behind you. The scripture tells us, your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart. That the hidden things that God says, I have prepared for you. you you've got to keep going. You've got to stay on your tiptoes with anticipation, the spirit of anticipation and expectation. That the best is yet to come. And I just wonder in this place today, if you are believing that you are expecting God to do great and mighty things today and in the year to come, I just want to give a little praise break so that the Lord would receive the glory and activate your faith. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Lord, that we are activating our faith. Lord, that we praise you. We bless you, Lord, and thank you for what is yet to come. Yet to come. You and I serve a God that is greater than our faith. Maybe you feel like your faith is peaked. You serve a God that is greater than your prayer life. Did you know that? God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. To forget you, he would have to be unrighteous, and that is impossible for God to do. Because he always remembers what he promised. So the question is, are you expecting it? Are you expecting it? With tiptoe anticipation that you come expecting to receive something today in this service. I want you just a moment. Would you just take a moment out and ask your neighbor, the person next to you, are you expecting? Yeah. This is loaded. <laughs> and don't tell me if you're 99, you can't expect. Bible proved you wrong. Are you expecting? I want you to turn to your other neighbor and say, are you expecting again? You can be careful what we put in the coffee around here. No, it's all good. Are you expecting again? See, a baby is born in pain. In anguish, a mother gives birth to a child, Right? That God does show up in pain. And I'm going to tell you something for those of you today that are in pain. God is about ready to show up. And he's wanting his people to expect him to do something great. Come on, you're not going through that pain just because you're going through the pain. You're going through it to birth something powerful. Amen. When they set the lame man down outside the gate, he looked on Peter and John. He saw them expecting to receive something from them, and really what he was expecting was what he received every other time he came to the temple, and that was a get-by blessing for the moment. The same thing, he keeps coming to the temple every day. 
expecting to receive the get by blessing just for the moment. Just enough to keep him going. Maybe it's an hour more or two hours more. But, but, but that we come today expecting more than just a get-by blessing. That, that this word, the God's word, is just only going to be good for me for maybe another hour after this. But you're going to come and you're going to expect God to do something greater than you than just a get-by blessing. I'm saying to somebody who is addicted today in this service, that God is going to change your life, uh, that, that he is going to set you free from, from your addiction. He can do that today, and, you can, and it's going to take you daily walking that out. But God can deliver people from addictions. There's an atmosphere here. If God can't deliver people in the church from addictions, we might as well close the doors and lock it up now because there's an atmosphere here of faith. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm speaking to you, to the God that is immeasurably more. Sometimes we come to church and we lower our expectations. Sometimes we live in low expectations and the smallness of who we are on any given day when God's called us to something greater in him. Don't lower your expectations. Raise it in Jesus. God can change marriages in this room that are on the brink of divorce, that are on the brink of separation, that God is here to do immeasurably more if you'll just come expecting to receive something today from him. Another story in Mark chapter 10, you know well, blind Bartimaeus, he had a beggar's garment, the Bible said. We read that and don't think anything about it, but in that day, government issued them an official beggar's garment. It was a certain color that when people saw them alongside of the road, that would say, that was issued by the government. They are a legitimate beggar. That either means they are blind or they are ill or incapacitated some way. That's how they identified them. But the Bible said that when he heard Jesus was passing by, verse 50 of Mark 10, it said this. He did something amazing. He threw his cloak aside. He threw the cloak off of him. What he was saying is, listen, I know I can't see this man named Jesus but I know that he is in my vicinity and I'm casting away with full expectation that God is going to touch me. He is going to heal me and I'm going to receive my sight in the name of the Lord Jesus. Some of you need to throw and cast aside the doubt, the things where you waver on. You need to cast aside these things. You need to throw them out there and say, Lord, I can't see you and I might not even be able to feel you, but in this moment I know you are in the vicinity to do something through me. Amen? That is the faith of expectation. Amen? That Jesus is going to give me a miracle today in Jesus' name. Amen? And immediately he received his sight. Last week I spoke on our capacity because Ephesians 3 is about capacity. This whole part of the text here is about an inward capacity and perception of his presence and all of those things that, that listen, What we have received is not insignificant or incidental. It is his power that is at work within us. And God is calling us to expand our internal capacity so that we can reach a lost world. How can we accomplish all that God wants us to do this year? Well, it's according to his power that is at work within us. Whose power? His power. The Holy Spirit's power. But if you look at the text of Ephesians 3... Going further into 14 through 19, I'm going to read this. That I pray that out of your glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his what? Spirit. In your inner being so that you may dwell in your hearts, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of God filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I want to talk to you for the remainder of our time knowing this, that when Jesus left this earth, he left us another comforter. He left us another helper, the Bible says. He didn't just walk away from us, but he loved us enough to leave us another helper called the Holy Spirit, and he is a comforter, right? Understand this. Understand this, that Jesus is God the Father's gift to you of eternal life. Did you catch that? 
Jesus is God the Father's gift to you of eternal life, but the Holy Spirit is Jesus' gift to you to empower you in this life. That's a gift marked with a promise. In Luke 3.16, a little further, it says, And he, speaking of Jesus, shall baptize you, John the Baptist, and said, In the Holy Spirit and fire. What does that mean? Well, the, the Holy Spirit desires you. The Holy Spirit, while you're in this room today, he desires more of you than ever before and more of me. More of you, more of me. And I want to talk about five things. What the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. Number one, he wants to invade you. An invasion is a military term. When one army invades the territory of another, they conquer it. It's an invasion. They're all over the place from the land, the sea, the air. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, it's an invasion internally. It come, he comes to invade you. And he comes to fill every inch of you. And here is many, here's a scripture verse that tells us that this is a spiritual invasion because Isaiah 58, 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. See, there's an invasion that is happening through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit wants to invade you and me more than ever before. He wants to invade your life with his presence. See, you've got to realize he wants to invade you to fill you because Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled every single day, every single moment. Secondly, not only will he invade you, but he wants to envelop you. The word envelop is found in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 when it says, the Bible states we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And he said, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Here in my hand here, I have a letter. You and I are a letter, the Bible says. Written on us where the Spirit of God writes upon our heart. That we are a letter. And inside of that, I'm taking this envelope. And inside of this, you see what it means to be enveloped by the Holy Spirit. That you and I are called to be enveloped by Him. And so, we are this letter. We are to go inside the envelope. And then I'm going to seal the envelope. Ephesians tells us that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That means dirt can't get to you. That means uncleanliness can't touch you. It's because we are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only when the Spirit envelops you, see, he comes to invade you internally, but he envelops you externally, and he seals you with the power of the Holy Spirit and then we know if we have an envelope and we've addressed it, do we just leave it on our counter? No. We take and we put it in the proper hands and he delivers us. We don't leave it on our counter. Why? It has a place to go. It has to be delivered to the desired location. And that is the same thing that God's presence does with us. He invades us. He comes, and as we allow him more of us, and he envelops us, and then delivers the contents wherever it is supposed to go. So he wants to deliver you out of one place and take you into another place, out of defeat and out of addiction and out of bondage and into victory and into joy. Amen? So he not only seals you and not only delivers you, but notice he protects you, verse 14. He is a Deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to do. The Holy Spirit says, I will invade you, I will envelop you, and thirdly, I will, and I want to instruct you. John 14, 26, but the helper, which is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Listen, he says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. That's a very powerful verse. And will remind you of everything that I have said. Listen, 
I want to share this with you. Um, this scripture really moves me, and I hope it moves you. As I go back and look early on and when God had called me, that when I started preaching, I told God, I don't even know how to preach. Are you kidding me that you're calling me to do this? This is going to be bad news because I, many of you know my story growing up, I couldn't even stand in front of people. I had such a fear of people to stand in front of them. And I'm thinking, God, you're calling me to preach? This is really weird. This is really crazy, and, and, and I can't do this. And I remember my, the first message I ever preached was Jude 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Now, that, I remember that, that was a Sunday night I preached that message in front of a church, and I want to tell you something. I was so scared and freaked out. Well, I thought I had to preach about an hour, and I looked down at my watch when I was done, and it was only 10 minutes. Some of you are like, well, where are those days, Pastor John? Well, God got a hold of me. God got a hold of me. Got a hold of me. I want to tell you something. I can't do this without the power of God's presence. I understand fully who I am, that I, I'm human and I'm frail and I got very, a lot of weaknesses just like you do. And there's many times I can tell you that as I've learned and grown in my gifting and learned to rely more on the Lord, there's times I've gotten up and preached a message in the flesh. And I've had to go home and I've had to say, God, I am sorry. I realize that it is from your spirit that you anoint me. And you give me the strength to do this, and I have to have you. And listen, church, I don't care to do this without the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do it. I don't take his work for granted. I can't do it. But it's in that night meeting, I remember as I'm speaking and freaked out and scared to death, I felt so weird that people began to get changed. And people came up to me and talked to me afterwards and, and told me, wow, that message and as you were preaching, it showed me many things about my life, and, and God began to stir. And see, you can't minimize what God has called you to do. You just do it in God's power and his strength. Well, God, when I'm fully ready, I'm going to go do that. No, no, no. You need to get out there, and you need to do what I'm calling you to do. See, see, it's in that you got to realize that, John, you need to say it like this, and, and, and don't say this. You get out there, and you obey me. And, and let me tell you something. You have no idea when a Pentecostal preacher starts preaching what's going to happen next. That's all I got to say, all right, because I was born into Pentecost as, as my parents and, and, and a Pentecostal preacher. And, and uh, I tell you, as you just come, there's times, man, many of you know I'm a, I'm a transcript preacher. So, I, I'm, I, man, those guys that can get up there and those ladies can get up there and do that without a note. And I, I worked under a pastor like that, and I was just like amazed. I, kudos to them, and I think that's great. I have not been able to fully do that as, as, I, as I go through it and trust in the Lord more. But I realize there's just times I may have a note in front of me, but the Holy Spirit is speaking right now. And there's times I just veer off my notes because God is speaking. As you're looking at me and I'm looking at you, God's telling me things, and I just want to be obedient for him to say it in this midst because this is such an atmosphere where his power and his presence comes and speaks to our heart because our moments are limited. And you're in the same place as well. That you may not speak behind a pulpit or whatever it may be or teach behind a podium, but there's other things that you are doing where God says, I want you to go there, but I don't want you to go there. I want you to do this, but I don't want you to do that. Just the leading of the Holy Spirit, right, in our lives. And so it's so good to know that through the word of the Lord, and I want you to always understand this, you never have to pray for God's word to be anointed. It's the vessel that has to be anointed. And it's the same thing with you. You never have to pray, God, anoint this word. It's already anointed. It is inspired. Amen? But you and I need to pray for us as the vessel. Lord, anoint this vessel to do what you have called me to do. Amen? That God wants to speak to you. I know like our, this uh, Sunday night of every month, there's hearing the voice of God led by the bakers that they come and they give. And they want people as an atmosphere to hear the voice of God, scripturally, and what he is saying. So, I, you know, I just get up here and do what God's calling me to do. And the Holy Spirit says sometimes you need to say this right now. And you need to do this right now. 
Number four, the Holy Spirit will impress you. What do I mean by that? One of the frequent operations of the Holy Spirit is to bring impressions upon us and what we're to do. He'll impress you. Now, the impression he gives me doesn't mean it's the impression he'll give you. But he gives us impressions. Sometimes we get locked and we say, well, if it doesn't happen this way, it couldn't be of God. Well, we believe in running it through the filter of God's word so we don't get out of alignment and get freaky and weird and kooky. Okay? But we come and we come and say, okay, God, you're impressing this person. I've told you guys many times, like he's done with you, he do, does with me, is I see somebody in this church or somebody in the community and their face will come to mind. And I've realized in those moments, that's God speaking to me. And I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to find out what's going on. And more times than not, I usually pick up the phone, I'll call them or send them an email, whatever it may be. And they're usually going through a valley. They're going through some type of grief or there's something that they just need to know somebody is there on the other end of the line. They need to know somebody is there agreeing with them. Now, do I do, 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 I do 100% of that? No, I don't. But see, with the little nudges of the Spirit, God's speaking and saying, hey, this person I'm bringing to your mind for a reason, just like you. Don't keep pushing that off. Welcome it. Grow in your capacity through the impressions that God's giving to you, that he'll impress you to pray for a person. It's the impression of the Holy Spirit. He'll, he'll impress upon you to witness to somebody. Say this, don't say this. Uh, a week from this last Friday, I met a gentleman in, in our church up in Winchester at Starbucks. And as, as, I, as I went in there, I was waiting for him to arrive. And I'm waiting there, and I'm looking across the room. And there was a gentleman sitting down, and I looked at him. And then I looked at him again, and I was like, I, I know him. I never thought you knew somebody, and you did really know him. I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he looked at me. And he got up out of his chair, and he came over, and he walked over to me. As he got closer, I realized it wasn't the guy that I knew. <laughs> I said, okay. I shook his hand. I said, I'm John. He said, my name's Clement. I said, nice to meet you. He said, nice to meet you, sir. So we started a conversation. He was with a bunch of other sharply dressed uh, men that were there that day. And um, we just started talking. And as we talked, he said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor in Stevens City. I said, where do you live? He said, I live in, live in Stevens City as well. I'm a pastor of a church. I said, so what do you do? He says, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I said, okay, it's nice to meet you. I said, God bless you. And we talked a little bit. I didn't get into that moment quarreling about my theology and my beliefs. It's not the moment. It's not there. It's a point of contact where we're just saying, hey, who are you? How are you doing? All those things. And then we, then we keep talking a little bit about, and yes, he says, well, listen, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. He said, are the people in your church concerned about the world we live in? I said, absolutely. He said, yeah, so are the people that, that I speak to that are underneath my care and my keeping. I said, that's, that's good. I said, you know, we, are, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that he's the way and the truth and life. He's, he's the answer to this world's problems and this world's needs. And, and he looked at me and he shook his head and I wasn't expecting a great amount of agreement out of him. I was just kind of telling him just that witness of my heart for the moment. I don't know what that moment did. All I'm believing is it planted a seed. That's all I felt I should have done at that moment. I'm believing that this Jehovah Witness is going to know Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And that he'll know Father God. And that's my prayer. And so never underestimate the people. You may take a double look at them. And God says, that's your divine appointment for this moment. That's your divine appointment for this hour. That's who I want you to speak to. Begin to open up the doorways. The Holy Spirit will impress you. He'll impress you. He'll impress you to give. He'll impress you to reach into your pocket or your purse and give some money. One of his chief functions is to bring impressions. 
bring impressions, impressing you. And lastly, the Holy Spirit wants to live within you. He is an indwelling presence, John 4, 14. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So he says, I want to come and live inside of you. I want to indwell your body because our bodies are a temple. The Holy Spirit says today, I'll invade you and I'll envelop you and I'll instruct you and I'll impress you and I will live inside of you and you will never be alone again. Let me tell you something, church. When you accept the Lord as your Savior, you will never be alone again. Never. Well, I feel lonely. That's a feeling. He said, I'm with you always. That's the promise of the Father to get on your tiptoes with such expectation that I want to encourage this church to move towards such expectation in Him as we keep this series. Next week, I'm going to talk more about vision as we move forward, but there are some of you that have come and you've called this your church and you've been here long enough and I know it takes a while to get into the body that are just standing and sitting on the sidelines and not giving of your gift and your talent to the voids that we have in our kids. Man, this isn't a complaint session, but you just have to say these things. I mean, a lot of times this doesn't work in the church anymore. Everybody wants to be come to individually and asked, and, and this church is vast and big, and we try to do that just to be a part of a ministry. But, but listen, where does it come to the point where the people of God hear the cry of the Spirit of God just to do what He's called you to do? In our kids' ministry, in our students, we say they're our future now. Our young adults, our adult ministry, all throughout this church, we've minimized the work of the Spirit. That He's speaking to us now. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the church. Everybody wants to feel special. Everybody deserves to be known. You are in Christ. Today, God can speak to you. Today, you can get more than a get-by blessing. He can give you immeasurably more of who he is. There's a story of Ananias and Paul and how that Paul had an encounter on the road to Damascus. You've probably heard this story, Acts chapter 9, and it's more powerful than ever before every time I read it. He became blind for three days because Jesus was shining such a light from heaven. He encountered Jesus in that he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's his exact question. Lord, what would you have me to do? Well, he became saved. He changed his name from Saul, the tormentor, to Paul, the apostle. Paul saved, but he's still blind, not filled with the Holy Spirit. And God spoke to Ananias and said, listen, I have a chosen vessel called Paul, and I want you to go lay your hands on him that he might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Ananias went, and the Bible said the apostle Paul received Ananias. And when Ananias laid his hand on him, the Bible says that the scales fell from his eyes. There are some of you in this room, you have a religious spirit. That's one of the first things that fell off of Paul. That the scales of religiosity would fall off of you. Listen, you're in the vicinity of Jesus today. He's speaking to your heart. He's speaking to this church right now. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. There are those of you in this room that you need a powerful touch of God of healing. God is able to heal you in this environment. I believe that. He can do it anywhere, but this is a great environment. Some of you have such brokenness in your life that you need God to heal you and repair you. This is the environment. But God wants to heal you today. That religion would fall off of you, to help you. Some of you in this room, you need to be delivered from an addiction that you have had in your life for so long. This is the environment where God can heal you of an addiction. It's tiptoe time for the body of Christ. It's tiptoe time. So as you're standing to your feet today, I want us, the worship team is going to lead us. Everyone, would you please stand that we are going to come to God with a tiptoe type expectation that God's about ready to do immeasurably more 
than all we can think or imagine in this room. And we're going to open our heart and we're going to worship the Lord. So I just want to encourage you, don't leave right now. That there would be such tiptoe-like anticipation in your heart and expectation that God's going to meet you at your point of need. 